Thank you so much, Bruno. I think that was a great uh, introduction. And um, I'm not going to talk about COVID. I think we've all been hearing far too much about it over the last couple of years, and we, we want to move on. However, there are many lessons from COVID and many things that we've done, especially the way science has advanced. We're going to hear more about mRNA and things like that. But what I would like to do today is to talk a little bit about something that's close uh, to your hearts, I'm sure, and that's about data and digital tools and how we use that to deal with uh, health emergencies. Now, if you look at uh, this visualization of, um, of a health problem, which is in this case, maternal and neonatal mortality, then we can see that um, we're very far away from the SDGs, and that's just one of the indicators. We're actually going backwards on many of the SDG health indicators, and therefore we, business as usual, isn't going to be good enough We've got to learn to do things more efficiently, faster, and, um, and also more collaboratively, as we did show was possible during COVID. Again, you'll be familiar with, uh, with this, the mobile phone revolution, starting from 2000. And this visualization basically shows um, how Africa, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, you know, the mobile phone penetration is out of proportion to the, uh, even the large populations that live there. And therefore, this actually provides us an opportunity to, to do things differently. So at the WHO, we've been um, really thinking about the digital transformation of health systems for some time now and moving our guidelines, our recommendations, our norms and standards onto platforms that are much more user-friendly that are uh, you know, timely and, and that can deliver to people the information they need uh, at the click of a, of a button. And, and while Google is great, uh, it's not necessarily uh, always providing the right information. And so this is something we're working with the tech partners, with um, not just Google, but many of our, the big technology companies to see how can we actually uh, uh, make it possible for people to, to see um, credible and, and good, solid, evidence-based information when they're searching for something. Um, and, and one of the, our activities which is going to accelerate now is really taking all of our guidelines uh, and converting them into, through these digital implementation guides, helping countries, developing the standards so that these become interoperable, that they can be used with open source uh, software standards across the world. And then we'll also enable the data that comes in uh, to, be, uh, to be shared in much easier ways than is possible today. And, and these are just some of the examples of, of some of the products over the last few years. We've had a program called Be Healthy, Be Mobile. You mentioned the second part of today is going to talk about keeping people healthy. This was a collaboration with ITU, basically just using mobile phones and SMSs to um, provide people um, uh, messaging on, on tobacco cessation, for example, or on diabetes, self-management, on hypertension. And it's been quite, uh, quite successful and something that could be scaled up. The other good uh, example is the, is the COVID vaccination uh, certificate, which, as you know, all of us need to show when we travel. And if we did it in the old ways in which each country provided it on a different type of a platform, then it would not be recognizable by the country. So this was one of the first things countries asked us to do is to provide the standards so that uh, a computable form of the, of the uh, certificate could be widely used. And building on that, we're going to go further. So I was talking about guidelines and, and the way that WHO normally does guidelines in the past has been that you know, they're updated every once, every few years, because it's a lot of work to to do the systematic reviews, to, to make the changes, to then publish it, then these, of course, have to be adopted and implemented by countries. But again, COVID accelerated our, uh, our uh, movement to something we call the living approach to guidelines, where artificial intelligence is actually working in the background, screening literature, and, um, and um, triggering when a recommendation should change, and telling us there have been three new large studies you know, on the use of this drug for the treatment of this disease, let's say dementia, I think you need to look at your guideline. And then it goes into this living systematic review process. And, and it's easy if it's on a digital platform to update 
the recommendations in a much more timely fashion. And so this then brings the latest uh, information based on solid research and evidence to healthcare providers, doctors, nurses uh, around the world, because our primary audience are healthcare providers, though WHO is now getting into also talking directly with the public. And again, that's something we started during COVID, but we realized that there's a value to WHO speaking directly to people about how they, what other things they can do to have better health. So again, you know, collecting data uh, and data sharing is, is going to be critical in the days to come. And I think we have to solve some fundamental problems on how we do that. I'm delighted that we're actually working with CERN uh, to look at how we handle research data that, you know, there's loads of it around the world that's not really most efficiently being used today. But then you need analytics, you need people who are trained to analyze and look at data uh, and especially large data sets. And then the actionable insights that come from this data is very important. And again, we need people who are trained in looking at, uh, at data and being able to, to um, have these, uh, uh, these insights that then will inform action. And we saw during COVID again, the huge variability between countries in how they used evidence and how they used that to make policy. And, and the best, uh, I think, the countries that did the best were those that actually had a multidisciplinary team looking at data and constantly updating their guidance and also were, be, were quite humble about the fact that they needed to change and communicate it better. So one of the new things that's been set up um, about a year ago is the hub in Berlin. It's called the, the WHO Global Hub for Epidemics and Pandemics. And, and, and they will now host this international pathogen surveillance network. We've seen genomic sequencing capacity expand many fold across the world, when today even the average person on the street can talk about variants and sequences and, and RNA and DNA and things they hadn't heard of before. And so this kind of network will hopefully for the future build a trusted network of, of partners around the world who will share data, who will you know, build capacity. Again, you look at this map, you'll see that Africa is generally underrepresented in, in, in these kind of um, capacities, but they given an opportunity, will catch up very, very fast. We have also normative, our normative role, so coming out with policies. This one, for example, on the reuse of health data for research, and as I mentioned, we're working with CERN to set up a metadata repository based on the Zenodo platform that, uh, that CERN has, has used in order to make the secondary use of data possible for researchers and to, and to um, encourage more international collaborations in health research and be able to use things like artificial intelligence, which you can only do when you have very large heterogeneous uh, data sets. We also recently came out with the guiding principles for pathogen genome data sharing. These have just been published on our website. And uh, this was uh, done actually over years of, of, uh, of discussions uh, uh, with groups around the world because there's a lot of uh, sensitivity around data sharing, but also around the equity aspects of the benefit sharing. And there are many questions raised about, yes, you want us to share data, but how about the benefits? How do they get shared? And we saw what happened with, with vaccines, uh, but also with diagnostics and so on. So I think equity now today is very much the center of uh, discussion uh, globally. Technology has changed the way that information is produced, distributed, and, and consumed. And one of the early quotes from Dr. Tedros uh, in February of 2020 was when he said, we're not just fighting an, an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. And we've seen today how fake news spreads so quickly, especially through uh, social media channels. So I think as scientists, all of us need to think very seriously about this issue of the trust in science, and uh, which if goes the wrong way, it can really have very negative consequences as we are seeing with the anti-vaccine groups, really spreading a lot of doubt among people and today having an impact, even reaching out to the developing countries in Africa, for example, and sowing doubts about childhood vaccines. And you can imagine what is likely to happen with diseases like measles and, and diphtheria and polio that we had a good handle on thanks to good vaccines all of this can be lost very quickly if this uh, trust is, is eroded. And so it's not just trust in science, but 
trust between people in, in a society and trust between people and the government. And this slide basically shows uh, um, studies that have been recently published showing that vaccine coverage, for example, is, is uh, linearly correlated with, uh, with trust in government. And on the other hand, uh, corrupt government was inversely correlated with vaccine coverage. And I have heard many anecdotes from many countries uh, actually corroborating the fact that where people do not trust their government and, and there weren't credible sources of information, vaccine coverage actually has been extremely low despite the availability of vaccines. So we're going to hear a lot about new technologies. So I'm not going to go into the details, but clearly we're think talking about things like digital inoculation. How do we address this uh, fake news and, and uh, anti-science? We're thinking about an infodemics tech cell. Of course, AI is going to play a big role in medicine in the future. So we're focusing again on developing regulatory uh, and ethical framework so that countries or, in, or institutions that are going to implement AI-based solutions for health uh, have a framework uh, of ethics with which they can work. And of course, we we'll need to look more and more at, uh, at how to use these emerging technologies, uh, as you said, Bruno, to really help people live healthier lifestyles. And we already have this, uh, this a chatbot with Florence, you can see on the screen there, who will answer questions on things like tobacco use uh, or COVID vaccines or, or mental health. And so we want to really build and expand on, uh, on, uh, on these technologies, but do them in a way, again, that is, uh, that is based on science and evidence that is updated frequently, but that's also accessible. Because when we think about these cutting edge technologies, I think the fact is that still there are large parts of the world where people don't have access either to traditional uh, healthcare uh, and certainly they may get left behind. So again, I just I want to end with this, I think very wise quote from Stephen Hawking where he says a future is a race between the growing power of technology and the wisdom with which we use it. Thank you very much. Thank you.